Welcome to Prostate Pros. I'm Dr. Mark Scholes, and this is my co-host, Liz Graves. This episode, we're going to cover chemotherapy. There's a lot of fear and negative connotations that surround chemotherapy, and I think this reaction is pretty common because we've all heard about or been witness to friends or loved ones who suffered adverse effects from chemotherapy. Dr. Scholes, as a medical oncologist, which is the type of doctor who's trained to administer anti-cancer medications such as chemotherapy, how has this perception of chemotherapy and even medical oncologists developed and changed over the last couple of years? Chemotherapy, Liz, is a um, strong medicine that can uh, certainly cause undesirable side effects. Of course, balancing that is it can have powerful effects against the cancer. So this trade-off is an important consideration whenever doctors are considering the use of chemotherapy. Fortunately, chemotherapy has evolved and improved dramatically over the last 20 years. And a lot of the negative connotations are attached to the treatments that were given a couple decades ago. Modern chemotherapy is much more tolerable and much more effective than what we previously had. So chemotherapy may not be as threatening as it is perceived, but it is a way to treat prostate cancer. Chemotherapy is sort of a grab bag term that covers medicines that are usually given intravenously rather than orally, although now it's not necessarily the case. And of course, if the medicines can cause hair loss or if they can impede your immune system or uh, lower blood counts, uh, these sorts of side effects are the, are the ones that are attached with what we call chemotherapy. But chemotherapy is really just a medicine to treat cancer. And uh, there are many variants, and some are very low in side effects and quite effective. So chemotherapy has two roles in treating prostate cancer. The first is to treat metastatic disease, and the second is to prevent future cancer relapse. This means chemotherapy is usually reserved for men with more advanced disease, such as men who are in the indigo or royal stages. Exactly right. And the patients that we're trying to prevent a future relapse, they probably have microscopic metastatic disease. So using chemotherapy is almost always reserved for more advanced or at least aggressive types of prostate cancer. Is chemotherapy used as a monotherapy? So in prostate cancer, because you can talk about chemotherapy for a lot of other types of cancers, but with prostate cancer, it's extremely rare for men to not be treated simultaneously with some form of hormone treatment while they're getting their chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is usually used in combination with hormone therapy. And as we talked about in our previous episode, men can survive a really long time on hormone therapy. Is there any concern that adding chemotherapy to this is excessive? Absolutely there is. Uh, it is possible to get over aggressive and over enthusiastic because sometimes the responses to hormone therapy are so excellent that it's difficult to improve on the results. So the decision about when to implement chemotherapy requires real expert input and a real good understanding of how serious and how risky the cancer is. So chemotherapy can really help when it's um, administered appropriately to men with prostate cancer. Yeah, if you think about preventing future cancer relapse, that category is extremely important because someone who is destined to have a relapse could conceivably be converted into an out, an out cure. In other words, that their cancer would never come back because of the chemotherapy. But if they've foregone the chemotherapy, the cancer could relapse in the future. So this approach of using chemotherapy to prevent a future relapse is a common theme, not only with prostate cancer, but with breast cancer, colon cancer, head and neck cancer, lung cancer. And it is effective in improving cure rates, but it has to be applied in the correct situation. This is something that's discussed in the Key to Prostate Cancer. Um, they mentioned the charted trial, and they talk about how maybe a combination of chemotherapy and hormone therapy might lead to a slightly decreased quality of life while you're on them. 
But because the chemotherapy can put men into remission, overall it's better. That's right. So if you think about getting into a remission where you're able to stay off chemotherapy for a long period of time, or perhaps even stop the hormonal therapy, which has side effects of its own, the net long-term effect is fewer side effects, even though men pay upfront with some increased side effects when they're taking the, the uh, chemotherapy. I hear you talk to patients about all the time at prostate oncology specialists. It's quality of life versus lifespan. Exactly. And that sort of an analysis is not easy. And it's the sort of thing that you want to discuss with each patient and find out what their priorities are. But I'm glad that we're able to discuss it today because sometimes these conversations never come up for discussion. And there's no doubt that studies show that a certain segment of men really do benefit by the early use of chemotherapy. If a patient is eligible for chemotherapy, what does that look like? What's the protocol? Well, the most common medicine uh, that we use is called Taxotere or Docetaxel as a generic name. And the most common protocol is an infusion intravenously given uh, every three weeks and requiring a doctor visit that may take an hour or two. And those cycles, three-week cycles, are typically continued for four to six to eight total cycles. And then as this process unfolds, men are monitored to determine how well they tolerate it. And then, of course, is there a good response? Are PSA levels declining? So when they're at the uh, visits getting the chemotherapy, are you checking their PSAs then? Typically, they'll get a PSA check every time they come in. Other blood counts will be checked to make sure that excess side effects are not accumulating. And then we talk to people, find out, are they having excess fatigue? Have they had any other unusual problems, uh, issues with their GI tract, rashes, uh, which are rare, thankfully, but can occur on occasion. Okay, so you've mentioned a couple side effects from chemotherapy, and this is something that a lot of people kind of puts them off from chemotherapy, but there are ways to regulate these side effects and manage them. Can we talk a little bit about that? Absolutely, and I think we've got to start with the same old theme when we were covering hormone therapy, and that is exercise. Studies clearly show that men have much less fatigue if they're able to continue on an exercise program when they're on the chemotherapy treatments. Fatigue is a very prominent side effect that is uh, cyclical, occurring for eh, two to six days after each infusion. And it's a moderate to severe amount of fatigue. People feel sort of like fluey and they're fighting off something and, and then it blows over and, and they get back to normal before the next treatment. Exercise makes a big difference in that regard. Prednisone is also can help with fatigue and chemotherapy. Yeah, some protocols advocate taking prednisone daily throughout the cycle. In my opinion, that tends to sort of decrease the beneficial effect. Your body just gets used to it. A more effective protocol is to take higher doses during and immediately after the uh, chemotherapy, which seems to sort of bridge men through the, the fatigue side effects. What about the nausea that's common with chemotherapy? Well, it's kind of cool that we don't talk too much about nausea anymore, which was previously such a common problem with all types of chemotherapy. And this is because the anti-nausea medications that are routinely administered are so effective. So nausea is kind of background noise in this modern era due to the effectiveness of the counteracting medications. Chemotherapy can also reduce platelet count or white blood cell count, which can lead to infection and sicknesses. But there's also medication that can help with that. The most common serious problem with any type of chemotherapy is the possibility of lowering the white blood cells, that's the immune system, to such a degree that people can become susceptible to infections, serious infections with bacteria. And Amgen makes a product, an injectable product, that stimulates the white blood cells during the chemotherapy and counteracts most, sometimes all of the effects on the low blood counts and thus greatly reducing the risk of infections. We use Nulasta, Nupagen, or there other such products routinely whenever we give taxotere chemotherapy. Some physicians prefer to reserve these medicines for the people who develop infections, which I think is a bad policy. 
The infections can be life-threatening, and they're certainly unpleasant and usually require hospitalization. Prophylactic use of these medications, such as Nulasta, in my opinion, should be a standard approach. What about the red blood cells? So low red blood cell counts are uh, otherwise known as anemia. And if people become too anemic as a result of treatment, then they can get short of breath, feel very fatigued and tired. And thankfully, there are medicines to counteract the anemia of chemotherapy, uh, also produced by the same company, Amgen, an injection that builds up the red cells. So whenever the anemia starts to become problematic, people should discuss with their doctors whether they can start on medicines such as Procrit or Aranesp, and these medicines will help build up the red cells. One last side effect that I think can be difficult emotionally is hair loss. So yeah, the official name is called alopecia, and it tends to be moderate, sometimes mild, and sometimes severe uh, with taxotere chemotherapy. The um, effects are reversible, but can be unpleasant. Men that are determined to not lose their hair can uh, use a form of an ice cap, which keeps blood flow and chemotherapy away from the scalp. And it's a bit of an involved process. And unfortunately, it's only covered for breast cancer, not for prostate cancer yet. So there could be some expense, but it is possible to control for the hair loss. Most men just endure it and then their hair grows back normally, or uh, at least grows back fully after the treatment is finished. You can see how men who've been private about their prostate cancer diagnosis may struggle with these visual changes. Remember that prostate cancer is a silent disease, meaning it might never have symptoms or might not have symptoms till very late stages. Let's say you have a patient who's struggling with some of these side effects. Are there any alternatives? Absolutely, there's a couple. Uh, one is to switch to another taxane, a closely related medication called Jevtana. Studies seem to indicate that the side effects are somewhat less, but uh, without any reduction in effectiveness. The Jevtana might even be used before Taxotere if insurance companies didn't tend to nudge people towards Taxotere first, I think primarily for cost reasons. But men that have the option or who develop side effects uh, can then switch to Jevtana and uh, probably enjoy a little better quality of life. Another option is to take the Taxotere and cut the dosage, and instead of giving it every three weeks, give a smaller amount on a weekly basis. And that has less fatigue and uh, less hair loss. There's a slightly higher incidence of um, low platelet counts, and so that has to be watched. The platelets are the substances in the blood that help blood clot normally. So sometimes the dosing has to be adjusted if the platelets drop too much. Okay, so we've talked about treatment schedule, which can be changed to help side effects. But when chemotherapy is being used in combination with, say, hormone therapy, how do those treatment schedules work together? The hormone therapy, thankfully, doesn't interact with the chemotherapy to a great degree. The medicines are usually uh, administered on a monthly or quarterly basis. When I say medicines, we're talking about hormone injections like Lupron. Whereas the chemotherapy is given as an infusion every three weeks, or as we mentioned, sometimes even weekly. The inconvenience of simultaneous admission really doesn't present too many problems. Can chemotherapy be administered at the same time as all different kinds of treatments? There are uh, some debates about using second generation hormonal therapies in conjunction with chemotherapy, that is. And uh, it seems that they can be safely administered at the same time. Small studies don't show any problems. Uh, historically, whenever we, we've used abiraterone or Zytiga, which is a second generation hormonal agent, we've held the pills a day before, day of, day after the taxotere. But some studies suggest that that uh, precaution really isn't necessary. Chemotherapy can be used safely with hormone therapy and with radiation, but what about immunotherapy? Right, and there are some hesitations in giving radiation and chemotherapy together because they can both lower blood counts. So usually we'll sequence radiation uh, before or after chemotherapy. But the immune therapy issue is a good one because chemotherapy causes cyclical suppression of the immune system, which is exactly the opposite of what you're trying to accomplish when you give immune therapy. When you give immune therapy, you're trying to build up the immune system and make it stronger. 
not only are immunotherapy and chemotherapy not given simultaneously, doctors like to have a space, uh, a period of time uh, separating these things so that the benefits of the immunotherapy or the chemotherapy aren't immediately counteracted by using them right after each other. So this is all very complex, kind of deciding which dosage is best and how to sequence chemotherapy with other medications. So I just wanted to address that it's very important to see a specialist who is very used to dealing with these sorts of little jigsaw puzzles. I need to remind people that most patients with prostate cancer are being treated by urologists who are surgeons. And it's only about one in a hundred urologists that would be comfortable giving any kind of chemotherapy. And some question whether even that 1% should be doing that at all. Patients with advanced disease or patients with high-risk disease where this question of chemotherapy comes up should be consulting with a medical oncologist. So with all of the modern improvements in prostate cancer medication, many men find that they can push off chemotherapy for a very long time. And when it finally becomes an option, they're afraid it's like a last-ditch effort. I think that perception is true. And of course, the good news is that we have all these other alternatives now, and it has allowed us to reduce the use of chemotherapy. But my experience with men who do start on Taxotere or Jevtana is that many are pleasantly surprised that the side effects are a lot less, that the specter of all these things that we've discussed, which sounds so daunting, really in practical day-to-day -day practice, don't turn out to be as bad as they thought. In West Los Angeles, where we practice, sometimes the traffic driving back and forth to the office visits every three weeks represent one of the big side effects that men are, uh, would love to be able to avoid. Do you have men in your practice that are just so resistant to go on chemotherapy? Yes, the word chemotherapy was generated 30, 40 years ago when the medicines that were really quite dreadful, really bad side effects and relatively modest, if any, uh, benefits. So it is the word itself is scary. And the idea that it may represent sort of a last-ditch effort, as you said, Liz, that, um, that, is, that is indeed scary. To counterbalance that is these medicines really work well and response rates are high. And you can see dramatic declines in PSA, uh, re resolution of spots on scans. So it's very gratifying to know that we have this, if we want to call it a backup treatment. Uh, the other situation we already talked about is using it as a preventative for future problems as well. And uh, that's a select group of men that is also reducing because of the effectiveness of hor hormone blockade alternatives. But there's still a role for chemotherapy as a preventative too. Here's an update on the recent news and developments in prostate cancer. In September 2019, Erlita was FDA approved for men with metastatic castration sensitive prostate cancer. Following that approval, in December 2019, Extandi, another second generation hormone therapy, was also FDA approved for men with metastatic castration sensitive prostate cancer. These new indications allow Erlita and Extandi to be options for men much earlier in their prostate cancer treatment journey. A study funded by the World Cancer Research Fund and Cancer Research UK looked at physical activity among roughly 79,000 men with prostate cancer and 61,000 men without prostate cancer. They found that compared to the least active men in the study, the men who were the most active had a 51% reduced risk of prostate cancer. One of the lead researchers said, this suggests there could be a larger effect of physical activity on prostate cancer than previously thought. So this will hopefully encourage men to be more active. As we open up 2020, remember to register for the PCRI mid-year update, which is March 28th. We hope to see you there. You can register at pcri.org. And that's the news update at this time. Chemotherapy is important for men in the azure, indigo, or royal stages. If you're a new listener or haven't yet taken the prostate cancer staging quiz, visit key2pc.com to find out your stage of blue. 
I first started giving Taxotere back in 1998, even before it was FDA approved for prostate cancer. At that time, it was only used for lung cancer. Taxotere has been a mainstay for controlling advanced prostate cancer for decades. The experience has grown and the methods to reduce its side effects have been refined over the years. It's a really effective medicine and when it's used in appropriately selected cases, it can be life-saving. As we end this episode, we also wanted to thank Peter Bowes, the host of the Live Long and Master Aging podcast, for having Dr. Scholes on his show recently to talk about prostate health, cancer, and longevity. Hello and welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. I'm Peter Bowes. This is where we explore the science and stories behind human longevity. Dr. Scholz, it's good to see you. Welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. Thank you very much, Peter. Do you work exclusively on prostate cancer? You can yeah. listen to the episode on llamapodcast.com. That's L-L-A-M-A podcast.com. We've loved getting emails from listeners. So if you have any comments or questions, please email them to podcast at prostateoncology.com. Remember to rate and review on Apple Podcasts. Talk to you next time.